We're going to continue really in our worship for the next, well, for the balance of the service, we're going to be worshiping the Lord, but uh, we're just going to take a, do something a little different than we've done in the past, but we're in this series called Disciple, and we're learning about what it means to be a disciple, a follower of Jesus, and the word that is right underneath is the word masterpiece. We talked about that, uh, a little bit about what that means, and that's from Ephesians 2.10, for Paul said that we are his workmanship, and that word workmanship means masterpiece. So we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which he prepared beforehand. And just as we, we're going to take a little break here, I'm going to ask you to do something. You're going to participate in the service. But, um, but before I do that, I just want you to think of, think of an instrument. Think of a masterpiece instrument. When I think of an instrument that's a masterpiece, I think of a violin. And there's a story, there's a story of a young man who inherited his house, uh, his parents' house, a very, very old house. And when he went to take ownership of the house, he went into the attic. And he goes and he looks around, he sees in the corner a violin case. He opens it up. He sees this old, dusty, just looks like it's just really old um, and worthless, really. He picks it up, he takes the bow, and he just crosses the bow against the strings, but he doesn't really know how to play the violin himself, but, and it makes all this screeching sound. He says, oh, this thing's old and probably worthless. And, but he decides to take it to a dealer. He takes that to a dealer, and he says, before I throw it away, I just want you to take a look at it for me. Tell me, is this really worth anything? Well, the deer looks at it and sees that it's all dusty and dirty and old, and, and you can't really tell who manufactured it. So he takes that violin, the dealer, and he begins to look at it. And he begins to dust and polish it. And when he polishes off, he sees the name of the manufacturer and the name of the violin. It's a Stradivarius. And the name of the violin is Messiah. And he looks and he says, where did you get this? From my parents' attic, I just was not being used. He said, he took, he just couldn't help himself. He took that old, dusty instrument that nobody had played. And he took the bow, and this was now someone who knew how to play. And he crossed it over the strings, pulled it. The most beautiful sound came out. And the dealer couldn't help himself. He just started to play. And as he played, the young man just started to cry because the music was beautiful. And he told him, he said, this is the most valuable violin made by Antonio Stradivarius in 1716. And the Messiah was the most valuable instrument he'd ever made. As we think about us, his disciples, a masterpiece. I want you and I to think of ourselves as that violin. In the hands of the master, what can it do? Created by the master as a masterpiece to play most, the most wonderful music. So we're going to continue our, our, our series with the message, but before we do, we ended last week, and we're going to do this every week, we ended last week with three questions. And these are the questions. And we asked you to go home and to spend some time with the Lord. And ask this, uh, uh, be prepared to answer the question. Really, ask him, who am I? What was I made for? And what am I to do? Who am I, what was I made for, and what am I to do? So what I'm going to ask you to do, and we're going to take a little bit of time, is I'd like you, if you don't, wouldn't mind, just to introduce yourself to maybe somebody you don't know. Take a little time, talk, mingle. You can just say hi, and you can just give your name. If You can maybe tell a little bit about yourself. Maybe share about whether you're a follower of Jesus or not, because that's what we're talking about as a disciple. Do I follow Jesus? If not, it's okay. If you do not follow Jesus, it is okay. If you have doubts, it's fine. This is the place where you can be comfortable. 
But you just say, this is really who I am. This is where I am right now. I have questions. I have doubts. I don't know. But guess why I'm here? Because I want to know. And so um, introduce each other, talk a little bit, and I'm going to invite you back, and I'm going to have the mic down here, and I'm going to ask some of you to share. Those of you who are online, if you have something to share, put it in the chat. One of our tech guys will come up and share that. But, um, but this is take some time. Talk to each other for a little bit. Get to know each other. Remember, we're the gathering. This is a family. This is home church family. Don't be shy. Okay? So I had somebody, and then we'll come back in just a little bit. As we look at what it means to be a disciple, a follower of Jesus, just an instrument, a masterful masterpiece of an instrument in the hands of a master. That is us, and that's what we're going to be learning over the next nine weeks or so. We're going to be learning about what, what has he called us to do, how has he called us to live uh, as his instruments. And uh, here at the home church, we believe so much in discipleship that what we, you'll see this, and you've seen it around, but we're going to keep talking about this, that what it means to be a disciple is to connect, to grow, and to serve. It means to connect first with God and then connect with each other. So we connect first with God, and then as a result of being drawn to his family, we connect with the church, and we connect with each other, and we connect with other people who are outside of the church. So it's all about connecting. And then it's growing. As a disciple, we, you come to Jesus, you're a new babe in Christ. You're born again. You have to grow. You have to learn what it means to grow. And we will be growing until we see him face to face. Amen? So we always have to grow. And we're all at different stages. But that's what the church is all about. Helping one another to grow. And, uh, and then the last word there is serve. That every one of us from the moment we become a disciple and a follower of Jesus, we're called to serve. So it's our desire to, to help and bless you to determine how it is God wants to use you, not just to plug you into a hole that we need to be filled, but to say, how is it that God wants to use you specifically? And how can, here in a safe place, how can we help you to serve? Maybe it starts out here, but after here, it may be out there, and of course it's out there. It's always in our lives, but so it's not just here in the church, but it's out there. And then ultimately, well, ultimately some of us will be sent out from here, and that's our desire, to see you sent out to be used by the Lord and wherever he has you. Connect, grow, serve. Anybody, if anybody ever asks you, what's the home church about? It's about connecting, growing, and serving, okay? So that's, that's what we're talking about when we talk about discipleship. And we recall from last week, this is what Jesus said about it. Jesus said, a disciple is not above his teacher, but everyone, when he is fully trained, will be like his teacher. So our goal as a disciple and follower of Jesus is to be like him, to look like him, to act like him, to be as he is, to be what he has uh, showed us that uh, he is and who he is, and that every disciple, each one of us, when we are taken out of the world and taken out from the kingdom of darkness and brought into the kingdom of light by saying yes to Jesus, he says that at that moment you are a child of God. And when you are that child of God, filled with his spirit, born again, you are his workmanship poema or masterpiece so if you are a follower of jesus you just look in the mirror every morning and you say no matter what you look like i'm a masterpiece i'm a masterpiece i'm the masterpiece made by the greatest master thank you god for making me your masterpiece masterpiece your instrument now use me today. So that's what Paul says that all of us are disciples, our work, we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in those works. And that's Ephesians 2.10. So we just asked the question today, who am I, what was I made for, and what am I to do? The next topic that we're going to be looking at is um, in our discipleship series is, well, let me ask you, if you're a disciple, you're a disciple of somebody. You've put yourself under somebody else to learn from, to follow. Well, do you think you need to know something about that person? Uh, who am I following? Uh, what do you, who are you? 
Do I know your identity? So, what we want to begin with, and for some of you, you may say, if you've been walking with the Lord a long time, oh, this is elementary. I already know the answer to this question. Well, what I'm asking you to do is to humble yourself. Set yourself before the Lord and say, Lord, there's something that I always need to learn something new. What are you teaching me? Help me to humble myself beneath the mighty hand of God that you would exalt me. Help me not to exalt myself. So let's be humble. Let's ask the Lord, what are you saying to me? How would you, would you show me something new that I don't know? So the question that we're answering today is, who is Jesus? Who is Jesus? This series is about being a disciple. A disciple is a follower, a student, an apprentice who has decided to follow another and learn from him or her. In order to be a follower, you have to know the identity of the person you are following. Correct? Correct. Yes. So who is the one that we're following? Who is this Jesus? Or if I'm thinking of being a disciple... Well, before I say yes, I need to know who's asking me to follow him. Jesus, you're asking me to follow you. I need to know who you are. And that's, that's a good question. Of course you do. So the answer to that question is Jesus is God. The answer to that question, Jesus is God. Jesus is God. Jesus is God, and, and that is the key. If you believe that Jesus is something or someone other than God, then I don't know who you're following. You're not following Jesus. Because Jesus claimed to be God, and either, as C.S. Lewis says, he was a liar, a lunatic, meaning he was crazy because he thought he was God and he wasn't. So he's either a liar because he knows he's not and he says he is. He's a lunatic. He's crazy because he believes that he is and he's not. Or he's actually God. He's Lord. It's the three L's. Liar, lunatic, or Lord. So who is Jesus? Who is this that we follow and serve? Jesus made it known that he was the Son of God, that he is the Son of God. God in the flesh, co-equal with the Father, and for that, he was crucified. Today, we're going back in time to the night before his crucifixion to listen in on a conversation in an intimate setting that Jesus was having with his first disciples. During this conversation, Jesus makes very plain his identity. And he did that in the last meal that he had with his followers before he went to the cross. Do you think that was important? Do you think that was an important conversation? Of course it was. So we're just going to kind of listen in as we go back in time. And, and just if we were there watching and hearing and listening, uh, that's what we're really going to do today. And we'll ask the Holy Spirit to show us some things. But this is the setting of this conversation. It is the night before his crucifixion. The 12 disciples of Jesus, they've gathered, they've gotten ready for the Passover meal. They're going to share this supper with Jesus. So they're all in this upper room, about to share in this last meal that Jesus knows is the last meal before his death, but they don't know it. And during this meal, all of a sudden, they're all at the table, and you can, anybody with big families, you know, it's just a lot of talking going on, past this, past that, where, and they're having this meal, they're sharing a meal together. All of a sudden, Jesus gets up from the table. He takes off his tunic. He gets a towel. He wraps it around his waist. He fills a basin with water and begins to go around to wash their feet. This was not something that Jews did. They had servants do it. It was unclean, an unclean practice to do that. And here was not only a servant Jew, but here was the master doing that for his followers. Their dirty, filthy, stinky feet. He's taking the water. He's washing their feet. He's taking the towel. And he's wiping their feet. 
When he had finished, he got dressed. And he returned to the table with them. He told them that he was setting an example for them. As their master, if he washed their feet, that they were to do the same for one another. And if they did so, he said, you will be blessed. But scripture tells us he was troubled. He knew what was coming. He was troubled in his spirit. Jesus was. Remember, the 12 are all still there, including Judas at that time. And he tells them all that one of you will betray me. Can you imagine how that must have made Jesus feel? Not only does he know it, but now he's telling them, one of you will betray me. He knows which one. But when he says that, without the identity, what can you imagine each of them are asking? And they actually asked, is it I? Is it me? Have you ever asked that question? Will I betray you? When things and times get hard, am I going to betray you? Jesus, is it me? They asked that question. And Jesus said, the one to whom I give this morsel of bread, that's who it is. And he gave it to Judas and then sent him out. And Judas left the room. And this is where we begin. When he had gone out, Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and glorify him at once. He's talking to these men that maybe are even older than him, but he looks at them and he says, Little children, yet a little while I am with you. You will seek me, and just as I said to the Jews, so now I also say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. He went on to say, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, just as I have loved you, I'm going away and I'm giving you this final commandment, one more. Love one another just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Jesus is telling them. Can you imagine this scene? He's telling them. He's sitting at the table with them. And he says to them, a new commandment I have for you. Wait a minute. Who are you? Who are you? The Ten Commandments were given to us by, the, by God on Mount Sinai. And now you're saying to us that you, the one we've walked with for three years, that we know as friend, you're saying, I'm adding to that. A new commandment I give to you. I give this new commandment to you. And he says to love one another. And we know that love is more than a feeling. By definition, it necessitates action. It is not love if there's no act associated with it. It might be a good feeling. But love necessitates action. Washing of their feet was a demonstration of both humility, which we as the followers of Jesus have to emulate. He showed us we have to live and act in humility, but it was also an act of sacrificial love. He was demonstrating to them that he was willing to lower himself, to sacrifice his position for their sake, to lower himself and to love them. And he says, just as I loved you, you are to love one another. That's my final commandment to you before I leave. Simon Peter said, Lord, where, where are you going what do you mean you're going to go away? And Jesus answered him, Where I am going, you cannot follow me now, but you will follow me afterward. And then Peter reminds us, I'm sure, of ourselves, doesn't he? He says, Peter says to him, Lord, why can I not follow you now? Why? I've given my life to you. I will lay down my life for you. Lord, where you are going, I want to come. I will follow you anywhere, even if it means my death. I will die for you. 
how easy it is for us to say that sometimes. I mean, have you ever been there where you say, yes, yes, I will die for the Lord. I will do that when I'm in the warm comfort of my home or with my friends or I'm worshiping the Lord and it's all safe. And yes, I will die for you, Lord. How easy it is to say, how hard to do. And Jesus even told Peter so. How often do we proclaim our dedication to perform great works for God? Remember Jesus? Jesus came full of truth and grace. You have to have the truth first, and then the grace is applied. And Jesus does not spare the truth. He doesn't even spare Peter the truth. He tells him. Jesus answered, Will you, Peter? Will you lay down your life for me? I'm sure Peter is now maybe with not as much enthusiasm as he said before. Yes, Lord. Yes, I will. We're not getting a transcript of the whole conversation, okay? But if you were sitting there listening, you would hear it all. I'm sure there was back and forth here. But, but the, then Jesus stops and says, oh, really? Did he have to say this? <laughs> he knew it. There are many things he knew were going to happen in the future that he doesn't say and tell them about. But here, he felt it necessary. This was, I have to tell you, Peter. Truly, truly, I say to you, Peter, my friend, my follower, the one who has said that you will lay down your life for me, I'm telling you, in the presence of all of your friends, all of those that you are trying to lead and show that you are at least at the same level as, in the presence of them all, Jesus says, I say to you, Peter, that the rooster will not crow this night until you have denied me three times. What if you were Peter? What are you talking about? And I, I can imagine, I don't think Peter, Peter may not have remained silent. He may have said, no way. I've got this sword. I am ready. If something happens tonight, I am ready. No, 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 I would never do that. How often do we declare that we will do for God and God says, will you? Will you really? And he doesn't say that sarcastically. He doesn't say that to humiliate us. But he says, he's reminding us, it's not what you do for me. It's what I do through you. And that's what I want you to understand. As long as it's you saying, I, I, I will do this. And I can tell you, you're not going to succeed. And I'm going to tell you the truth. You think you're going to build my church? I'm telling you, you will not. You will betray me. You think you're going to save the world? I'm telling you, you will not. No matter what you say or declare. He tells the truth first. There is no grace without truth. There is no following Jesus without first admitting the state, our, our state, the condition of our soul, of, of where we're at. Then he tells us the truth. You of yourself can do nothing for me. He, here Jesus tells Peter the hard truth. He tells him specifically, explicitly, the very details of what Peter would do in just a few hours. Something only God would know. Isn't that precious. We're still talking about it. That he told Peter before it happened how it was going to happen. And it happened just as he said within a few hours of him saying it before the cross. Why? Maybe because he wants to demonstrate his divinity and he wants to say, I am telling you this before it happens so that you know when it happens, who it was that said it to you, and that you can believe in me. Who is this man? A question they're asking, who is he? Do I, do I know him? 
That's a question we should be asking ourselves. Do I know Jesus? Do I really know him as God? Do I live with him? As God, do I have a relationship with him as God? Do I allow him to work through me? Do I know that I can't go and do anything, anything? We understand that if you have somebody from the bush in Africa who gets saved and you have somebody else who's a PhD, you understand that the PhD in, in divinity or has gone to seminary, if he's not giving himself over to the Holy Spirit to be used, He is of no use and no consequence. But the one from the bush who has nothing that anybody would ever look at is just completely ordinary. If he gives himself to the master to be used, then God will be glorified and seen through him. The ordinary becomes the extraordinary in the hand of the master. The one who thinks they're extraordinary is nothing. Nothing. And it's not, it's not wrong to say I am nothing in my own strength, but I am everything as I give myself to him to be used. And Jesus then, he knows that they're troubled by what is said. They know, he knows how Peter's feeling. This is, this is the Jesus that we're talking about, compassionate, concerned. He's just right away, hey, hey, don't let your hearts be troubled. I know they are right now. I know I just told you somebody's going to betray me. I just told you that. Now I've just told you who it was in your presence. It's Peter, not just Judas. But Peter's going to betray me tonight too. Don't let your hearts be troubled, he says. Believe in God. It begins with belief. Believe in God. But he doesn't stop there. That's what we say to each other. Believe in God. Believe in God. Believe in God. That's what a human being would say to another who wants to encourage your faith. Believe in God. He says, believe also in me. Believe also in me. He covers the truth with grace and mercy, with understanding and brings great comfort. Peter, when you're done, after you've betrayed me, Let me comfort you. Believe in me. Believe in me. Don't forget. Have faith, Peter. It's your faith. I am God, he's saying. I will comfort you, but you must have faith in my identity. This is the same Jesus that that we are followers of today. He does the same for each of us. He has brought both truth and comfort to us. How? The question is, how has he brought both truth and comfort? To you. How has faith been required for that comfort to come? How has faith been required for that comfort to come? Faith in Jesus and who he is. He goes on to say, in my father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you to myself, that where I am you may be also. I'm going away to my father's house, but I'm going to come back. Because if I'm preparing something for you, it means it's for you, and you have to be there to receive it. So I'm going to come again, and I'm going to take you there so you can have what I've prepared for you. He's telling them that ahead of time. He says, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am you may be also. And he says, you know the way to where I'm going. I'm going away, and you know the way. Thomas asks the question that we all would be asking. Jesus, what? well, before that, let me just do this. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Okay, first tell us where you're going, and then we'll know how to get there. Now you're telling us we don't even know where you're going, but you say we already know the way. How do we know the way to get where you're going? And Jesus says to him, I am the way, and the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father. He already says, I'm going to the Father. No one goes there. No one goes to where I am going except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. You think you don't know how to follow Jesus? 
Is that maybe your feeling? I don't know how to follow him in the way he's calling me to follow him. Well, Jesus is saying, we know everything we need to know about following him because we know him. It's about being in relationship with him. It's about yielding to him. It's about humbling ourselves and saying, I need to know you. I need to be one with you and be in relationship with you. Do you still have any questions about whether Jesus is God and he and the Father are, are the same? He, after everything he says, well, Philip did. You wouldn't be in bad company if you did. Because then Philip, who's there, would walk with him for three years. What does Philip say? Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father. And it's enough for us. Just show us. Just show us. We haven't seen the Father yet, so we need you to show us and make it plain. And that's enough for us, Lord. It's just a very little simple thing. Just show us the Father. And Jesus says to him, have you ever been corrected by a teacher? You're just like, why did I ask that question? Why did I ask that question? Because the, 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 when, when you get a question back, it's usually not, you know, real good. <laughs> have I been with you so long and you still not, do not know the answer? Stupid all? No, no. <laughs> no, he didn't say that. But he said, I've have I not been with you so long and you, you still don't know the answer. Do you still do not? And then he doesn't say that though. He says, and you still do not know me. But he talks directly to Philip. And you still don't know me, Philip. Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? The question is that we have to ask ourselves, who is this Jesus that we serve? Who is he? Is he God? And if so, what does that mean? In John 14, 10, do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. Or else, if it's very difficult for you to do that, and I know it is, believe on account of the works themselves. All the miracles that I've done, Tonight, you're going to see a miracle because I've already told you what's going to happen to Peter and he's going to do it. So I'm telling you, if you can't believe, believe in what I do. Believe in the works themselves and that will help your belief. And I'm going to call the, the, the worship team to come. And he says, if you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And then he says, he doesn't leave us alone. He says, I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, the Holy Spirit. So when I'm gone, I've ascended, I'm away, you'll have the Holy Spirit. Every follower of Jesus that declares Jesus as Lord and God has the Spirit within him, the very Spirit of Christ. And he says, that Spirit is me and I'm with you. That spirit, I'm in you, and I'm with you. Anything I'm asking you to do, I'll give you the strength to do it. And you just ask anything, he says, in my name, and I will do it. He says, I'll give you the Holy Spirit. Are we a disciple? Then we need to know who we follow. And then we have to be one, be in relationship with Jesus. And then he tells us to go and make disciples. Be one, make one. If you don't know Jesus, I'm asking you, I'm giving you, I'm just asking you to, to be honest. If you're online and you do not know Jesus, if you're here, you just say, I want to know you. This guy up there that I don't know very well is talking about you. He's reading some book that I've never read or don't really know. But if you're God, I think you can show yourself to me. I think you can reveal yourself to me. 
God says, if you humble yourself and you say, I want to know. I'm an honest doubter. I'm an honest doubter. I just have honest doubts. But I really want to know. I don't want to leave this earth. If you wanted to reveal yourself to me, show me. Teach me. Fill me. I promise you on my life, he will. He will. He's done it for all of us. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, we thank you. We thank you that you are in us, you are for us, you are with us. We thank you, Jesus, that you are the creator of all, the God of this universe. You came down, became a man to show us how we're to live, to live the life we couldn't live. You did not sin, and yet you paid the price for our sin on that cross, that we might, by believing in you, be one with you and the Father forever. Thank you for that. We love you, Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. I have the three questions for you for this week. I forgot to give them to you, so this is new for me too. <laughs> so, but I do have them. And I, I want you to take them with you and to be in prayer about them this week. And they are. Just answer this question when you're alone with the Lord by yourself. Who is, oh, where'd it go? There, back up, what happened? There we go. Who is Jesus? Who is he? You, know, you can journal that and just say, you know, if I thought you were one way, but you're another, would you show me? That's it. Do I know you, Jesus, the way you want me to know you? Do you know him? Okay, now you come to the place where you say, I believe Jesus is God. Well, do you know that, Jesus? Are you in relationship with him? Do you know him? And then thirdly, if you are his follower, you say, I know him to be God. I've decided to follow him, and I'm in relationship with him. Then the last question is, how will you follow him? It's not a question of writing all these things down. Right? And you say, I'm going to do all these things like a New Year's resolution. No. It's you sit with the Lord and you say, how are you calling me to follow you? Lord, it's you, not me. I don't want to make these declarations. I want you to show me. Show me and I'm willing to listen. And then write it down, whatever he says, and share it with somebody and say, I believe this is what he's called me to do. I don't think I can do any of that. But I need your help. You're part of my family at this church. Would you encourage me? And we're going to share that next week. So don't be afraid to come and share. I think he's called me to do this, but I don't know. I, you know, I want to. I want to. Would you help me? And we're going to pray for you. We're going to say yes. We're anointing you. We're praying for you. We're going to send you out to do what he's, you believe he's called you to do. There's, there's no reason to be afraid. Amen? Amen. So we're